Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another interactive Bible study. <clears throat> I trust that you've had a restful afternoon, and if you needed a Sunday afternoon nap, uh, don't tell me that you got one because I don't like to experience feelings of jealousy unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, let's see, before we begin tonight, um, in a little bit I'm going to have Jed doubt it to lead our first prayer, and then the song that we'll sing together will go along with what we're considering this evening, Dare to Stand Like Joshua, is what we'll be singing, and the text for tonight will continue what we started last week, and we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Before we get underway, I had, I had meant to uh, share this with you this morning. I have a request of our kids, of our kiddos. What I would like to, for you to have your kids to do, and it doesn't matter their age level, um, if, if they like to take a crayon to a piece of paper, that's fine. But what I'd like for you to do is have your kids draw a picture of Noah's Ark. You know, what do they think about when they hear the story of Noah's Ark? Have them to kind of illustrate that or draw a picture of Noah's Ark. And then as a parent, you can either um, scan it in and email it to me. Here, as a matter, as a matter well, after, after we do the prayer, I'll turn on the, the lower ticker. Um, but you can either text them to me, take a picture of it if you'd like with your phone and text it to me. Or what you could do is uh, text it to the number that we'll have scrolling on the screen here in just a moment. And that may be the easiest thing to do, just take a picture of it, send it to me. And my plans are to use it and to feature the pictures in one of our future rock class videos. And so have your kids, if they would like, draw a picture that comes to mind when they think about Noah's Ark and then either scan it in and, and send it to me through email or just take a picture and text it to me. The email will, the picture will come in a little bit better resolution, um, but I won't complain if you text it to me as well. Again, we'll put the phone number up on the screen here in a few minutes. All right, let me see. We're gonna begin here in just a moment. And let me make sure I've got everything ready. All right, let's go ahead, and like I said, we're going to be having Jed Douthit. He will be directing our minds in a word of prayer, and so Kelvin is making that happen through the magic of the Internet, bringing it right here to my house here on Millie's Trail. Hello there, Mr. Jed. If you would, sir, please lead us in a word of prayer at this time. All right. We all pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for another wonderful day you've given to us, a, a time that we can gather together, albeit apart, uh, together, together, together with you uh, to worship you and to sing songs of praise to you. I ask you to be with us now as we enter into this worship service that the things done here might be in accordance with your will and well-pleasing to you. We ask that you be with those who are in the first responders and those who are in uniform who are currently serving our nation as we tend to battle this epidemic of this virus going around. We ask that you watch over them and, and comfort them and protect them. We ask that you watch over all of us and protect us as well. And we ask that you be with us always and forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name, amen. Jed, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're so we're welcome. going to sing one song tonight. So if you want to gather your, your family members are probably already gathered around. But this song we're going to sing, Dare to Stand Like Joshua, goes right along in part with the lesson we're going to be considering this evening, especially when you consider part of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Kind of talks about the, the, the strength of the apostles and, and their willingness, even in the, the jars of clay that we live in, to press on in service unto oh, God. So let's 
all seeing dare to stand like Joshua. Hello. We are the Let's open our Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is what we're going to be considering here this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you would like to participate in our study this evening, we are going to place the information here on the bottom of the screen for you. There are several different ways that you can participate in our study. One, through Facebook. So if you're watching us on Facebook, Enter into the comment area, and we'll see it over here. If you're watching us through YouTube, same thing there. There's a chat room on our YouTube site. Use that. Um, but we also offer, I apologize, I have a little overlap here. Uh, you can also submit comments if you would like to our Twitter address, and you'll see that on the screen there, which has just disappeared on me. It'll pop up here in just a minute. There we go. Anyway, and you can also call us. You can also call us and we'll have that number available here in just a moment as it scrolls across the bottom of the screen. And by the way, when I, at the beginning when I was asking for pictures from our, our kiddos, um, uh, picturing Noah and his ark, the um, number that you can text those to if you would like will be on the screen as well, or you can send them to our email address, questions at seminalpoint.church. Feel free to do that as well. All right, like I said, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We looked last week at chapter 3, and so I decided this week we would just kind of go right on in, segue into chapter 4. So let's get that up to verse 1. And there you see that phone number now coming across the stream, 405-276-2966, 405-276-2966. If you have a comment during our study of the night, Text it there if you would like. Or if you really want to talk to me in person, you can call the number. Kelvin will answer the call, and then he will let me know and then transfer over to me as well. So let's go ahead and bring our passage up on the screen tonight. Now, if you remember from last week when we were looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the point, one of the main points that the Apostle Paul was making there had to do with the fact that by comparison, when Moses had come down off of Mount Sinai. The glory of that law was so great that the people were unable to look at Moses. So they had Moses to veil his face because his countenance was so great. And Paul makes the point in chapter 3 that something better has come. 
with far more glory. See, when God gave the the commandment to Moses on Mount Sinai, there was a change taking place. We call it from the patriarchal to the mosaical age. But God was now giving um, a, a law to his people, and they had a hard time accepting that law. Well, with the new covenant of Christ, there were many Jews who had a hard time accepting that because they wore the same veil, if you would. They, they, they were veiled to this new covenant that Christ was bringing in. And so it hindered them. And Paul will continue to build upon that idea here in chapter 4. Here in chapter 4, he'll continue to build upon that. Now, let's see. <clears throat> and there we go. So let's go ahead and start our reading, and then I'll be I'll check the, the chat room out here in just a minute, see if there's any thoughts or comments as we go through here. But let's start reading in verse 1, and we'll read through a number of, past, of verses here, and then we'll do the discussion there. So Paul continues, he writes, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. All right, so let's back up in the text there. So beginning there in verse 1. Looks like we've got some sort of family reunion going on there in the chat room. People know people who know people. <laughs> That's quite all right. That is quite all right. So notice here as Paul begins in this, in this, in as it's divided up for us, this chapter here. He talks about this ministry that God had given to them. All right. And he says, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, think about everything the apostles had to give up. See, so keep in mind, the apostles set the example for us in a manner of speaking. When Jesus called the 12, he called the 12 to essentially forsake all and follow him. Now, we know Peter had a wife, and so Peter didn't leave his wife. We, we, we're not in a very literal sense as we might think. But they had to find him most important. They needed to be willing to, as another expression he uses, take up the cross, their cross and follow him. Let the dead bury the dead. Any, if you look back, then it's going to hold you back and you won't be able to follow him. It's not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Just a slew of different phrases that, that kind of talk about that. So the apostles, they had already set an example for us because they had to make the same choice, the same sacrifice that we make when we become a child of God. So we notice that in verse 2. Let's look at that again. We have renounced the hidden things of shame. We, Paul says we, and, and, and not just the apostle, but now Christians everywhere, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. All right, that's the first thing. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There have been accusations, or it appears there have been accusations made charging the Apostle Paul with you know, preaching for the wrong reasons and so forth and, and, and mishandling the word of God, if you would. Well, he says, we've renounced the hidden things that, that of shame. We don't walk in craftiness. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. One of the things in a, in a conversation I had with one of our other elders earlier today, we have to be very careful during these times of distress that we're going through. I have seen too many people in the past hold to a staunch position until their life changed. And then they went to the scriptures to now justify their change. You know, one of the most obvious examples would be an individual who holds for years 
that you know you you cannot remarry unless your spouse commits adultery on you. You need to put them away for fornication to be free to remarry. And then 20, 25, 30 years later, his wife ups and leaves him. She doesn't love him anymore. And she's not running to another man. She just can't stand to be around him anymore. And then he finds another lady. And so he goes back to the scriptures. Now, wait a minute. How? Maybe I'm missing something. How, how can I justify where's, what doctor would let me remarry when All right, looks like that we are officially back. I don't know if we had a neck quake or a full on uh, outage here at the house. And I'm not sure what the last thing you heard was. So I'm gonna, I'm kind of back up just a little bit and see and just go from there. What I was talking about before we went down there is we must not manipulate the word of God to fit what we want to do, okay? We, we you know, if, if something is wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. If it's a matter of judgment, then it is a matter of judgment. So here in the text of verse two there, Paul is telling them that they did not handle the word of God deceitfully. They handled the word of God in such a way, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, all right, so this brings us back to what we were talking about at the beginning in kind of a, a preview or, po or looking back at chapter three there. But even if our gospel is veiled, he says it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now he'll continue on here and talking, he will talk about, um, he'll talk about what kind of is blinding these individuals there. And I think it's a very important point. But before we do, let me refresh something here. Hang on just a second. Yes, we definitely had a drop in our in our internet. And so let me Okay. All right, we have a I've been told we have a comment on YouTube from Jared Stroll, but I don't see that yet. It may take a minute for mine to fully update and refresh on this side. Uh, Kelvin, if you are able to drop it into our private chat, I can share it from here. Oh, I see what he's saying. We had a def we had a big old earthquake here in Oklahoma, in Edmond, Oklahoma. It was a digital earthquake. All right, let's try it again. Okay. All right, thank you, Kelvin. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so here's what Jared Stroll says. We'll share this now. He says, by always walking in the light, we do not have to fear when we are accused of wrong. That's true. Proverbs 28, verse one, the wicked flee when no one pursues but the righteous are bold as a lion. I think that is a very outstanding point. That is a very outstanding point there. The, you know, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lions. And this is how we would describe the apostles here. They were having to deal with the people whose minds were blinded by the God of this age, as Paul writes, um, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ is the image of God should shine on them. And that's kind of the tragedy um, that we see in all this. There are individuals who willingly say, no, thank you, even if they're that polite. They may not be that polite. They refuse to let the light of the gospel shine on them. They choose to wear that veil. All right, so they, they put the veil over their head and that veil, if you would, is the God of this age, the things that they worship, the things that they love, the things that they do not want to give up becomes a veil and it blinds them. So they do not believe the word of God. If they did believe, if they let the gospel of the glory of Christ shine on them, then they would find salvation. And so even in our lives as Christians, while we believe that we are walking in a pattern that is established within the word of God, 
we must always double check and restudy his word to make certain that we are truly in accordance to his will. And it's very, very point, a good point that we need to keep in mind there. So let's continue on in our text here. Kelvin, if you would, if we have a new one in Facebook, if you would throw that into IRC, mine still a little bit on, on the, uh, the slow of coming in there. Notice as he's bringing that over to me there in verse 5 what he says. And here's the point. He says, For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Now, if we really want to break this down word for word, we could, but I'm not going to. The point is that Paul viewed his service to God as being a bondservant really to the brethren. And that's why he worked so much to to support them, why he worked so much to teach them the word of God is all because of Jesus Christ and his love for the brethren. But notice what he says here. All right, they preach Christ Jesus the Lord, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There probably is an intended analogy here uh, called upon by Paul when he says, who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Go back to the very beginning, day one. In a very literal sense, God made light when there was none. He separated the light from darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night. Now that was in a physical way. But now when we consider this, we are looking at it in a very spiritual way. And this is what he's considered, this is what he's talking about here. Let me double check. All right. All right, things are still working a little bit slow on my end for some reason. Let's see if I can reset this here for a second. And mainly what it is, the comments. So we'll keep going until, until they, they populate a little bit better here. Notice again in verse 6 there, we're talking about in a very a spiritual sense, God commanded light to shine out of darkness. Jesus was that light, and in him was the light and the life of men. John 1 tells us here. So here we have the world, it is filled with darkness. We have Jesus Christ, he is the light. And so God commanded this light to shine out of darkness. You know, where there, and, and, and I don't know if this phrasing is, is particular. I need, to, I need to look at other translations, but it is interesting that he says to shine out of darkness. Jesus came, lived in the world among men, and from this world this dark world full of ungodly men, Jesus Christ came forth to be that light. And so in a sense there, commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All right, we've got a comment coming from Mike over here in the chat room. Let me bring it in. And I appreciate Kelvin, you kind of transferring that over there. If those to whom the gospel is veiled are lost, um, then what will God do with those who do the veiling? Okay, let's read that again. I understand the, the, the question that Mike is posing, and it's more of a thought question. If those to whom the gospel is veiled are lost, then what will do with the with what will God do with those who are veiling? You know, in other words, here you have someone who says no to the gospel of Christ because of the God of this age is blinding them to the truth, and they're willing to be blinded by the truth. What's God going to do to the one who is doing the blinding? Uh, it reminds me a lot of what Jesus talks about. If we cause one of these little ones to sin, that would be better if a millstone were hung about our neck and we were thrown over uh, into the depths of the water there. That would be better than to cause one of the little ones there to sin. It's a very good point, Mike. I appreciate that. All right, let's see. 
All right, so with that being the case, let's go a little farther here within our text. Again, if you'd like to participate in our study today, I know because of the, the internet quake we had over here, um, it's created a few little minor issues and delays, but you can email, you can send a text message if you would like to 405-276-2966. Um, you can also call that number and leave a message as well, or talk, wait, talk to Kelvin and he can transfer you over to me. Or you can also send us a question at questions at Seminole Point dot church questions at Seminole Point dot church. All right, let's see. We've got to, before we continue with our next section, I've just been made aware that we have a few other comments here in the text in our chat room. So let me get to those here swiftly. The first one comes from Jared. Here's what Jared calls to mind, Philippians chapter 2, 14 through 15, where the apostle Paul writes, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's exactly right. It is our responsibility to walk differently, to shine as lights within the world. We, we live in a flesh and blood body, but our, our whole life and our, our, the very desires of our mind should be different than that of the world. We should shine as lights within the world. Jared also shares with us Proverbs 29, verse 27, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Now, I like the little, little turn of phrase there you'll see in that proverb. You have an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way Ever, I've lost track now. He who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. And maybe that does kind of explain about when Jesus talks about, you know, it, it, you know, those who reject Christ, you know, they're going to reject and hate the apostles and those who follow Christ. Those who, who choose not to follow the Lord, they won't understand those who do follow the Lord. And so it's a, it's a good turn of phrase there in that. Michael Davis from... Um, Orleans, Indiana, writes, it's interesting how this treasure is in earthen vessels, um, how this treasure is in earthen vessels, meaning is, is personalized. All right? It is equated with Colossians 3, verse 16. Over in Colossians chapter 3, and I want you to notice with me there, in verse 16, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Colossae, and notice the, the admonition that he gives to them in regards to their service and to the Heavenly Father. <clears throat> he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. All right. We live in this physical body, but we need to let that word of Christ dwell within us richly in all wisdom. Arthel Bass, he shares the following thought. This is the third. Arthel Bass the third says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, well, both shall fall into the ditch. That is exactly right, Brother Arthel. I appreciate that. All right, let's come back to a text. It looks like everything has now caught up to speed uh, over here in our territory. So, Let's turn back now to 2 Corinthians again. And let me draw your attention one more time back to chapter 4. Sorry about that. This should have been a little bit faster than what's happening here. There we go. Let's go look at the next section, though, beginning in verse 7. In this section, Paul continues in the text. He talks about this treasure. All right, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about this, this message, this ministry. We're talking about the forgiveness of our sins. All these things um, we're, we're considering here is the idea of this, this treasure, this even this word of God is given to us in earthen vessels. Now, the earthen vessels or the English Standard Version says, I think it says clay jars. The idea here is he is comparing our physical body 
to a very fragile clay jar. Um, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls many years ago, they were stored in clay jars in uh, caves there in Quamran in, in a very dry environment. And some jars were there that had been broken. Clay jars aren't intended to last forever. They can be quite fragile. So this is what he compares our bodies to. <clears throat> We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This is the idea there, the clay jars. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. What that means is the work that the apostles were doing, even the, the miracles that they were, were able to do through the Holy Spirit was not of themselves. You know, here we have the omnipotent supreme being who created everything, and here we have the clay jar. The clay jar can do nothing but hold that which it has been given. And so he says that we have this treasure, it's put into these clay jars, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he goes through and he's about to talk about what these clay jars have to endure. We have a comment here from Dan Cross is what I am suspecting there based on what I'm seeing. And he makes the point here that light equals enlightenment, that light equals enlightenment. That's a good point. Chuck, he says, Jesus knew there would be those who would not believe. And that's sad, isn't it? It is sad that Jesus knew ahead of time that there would be individuals who would reject him. There would be individuals who would choose not to believe in him. You know, I, I, some might say that was pessimistic, but it really wasn't. It was very realistic. And he understood that. The, the passage here that Brother uh, Chuck has quoted, let me bring this up here on the screen for us. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. He says, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with the hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Very, very, very good point. Let's consider a couple more thoughts before we continue in our text. Jared reminds us of Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. Now, this is a very important um, reminder here. From Jeremiah 31, 33, he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. The difference between the children of Israel and us, and by the way, Hebrews 8 brings this, prop this prophecy up and, and makes the application of it, helps us to understand it. The difference between a physical Jew and a spiritual Jew, if you would, using Paul's terminology, is this. When a baby was born a Jew, the mom and dad had to circumcise the male child. And then the baby became one years old, two years old, three years old, finally 10 years old, 11 years old. Along the way, the child had to be taught about God. The child had to develop a belief in God, and there was a responsibility towards this God he had never heard of before since he was born until his mom and dad began to teach it. And then hopefully, hopefully, he would believe in that God and trust to follow God and, and obey that God. Sadly, we look at the history of the children of Israel, that was not the case. Many of them did not follow him. Now, us today, the difference, is you do not become a child of God without first knowing about God and being convicted enough to believe and to turn away from your sins. Then when you enter into the water grave of baptism, you rise up then to walk in the newness of life. God adds you to the body. He becomes your father through that spirit of adoption. So you only become a child of God because you've chosen to put the words of God on your heart. All right, so that's the fundamental difference. One becomes an Israelite without knowing anything about God. We become a spiritual child of God because we know about God. So that's something to think about there. Jared shares with us also in Acts chapter 9, verse 6, we will always ask what we do, um, 
Yeah, we need to always ask the Lord what it is that he wants us to do. Over in Acts chapter 9, let's look at the cross-reference there that Jared shared with us. In Acts chapter 9, specifically here, let's focus on verse 6. Jared, oh, Jared writes, sorry, Jared, not Jared. Luke writes the following. So he trembling and astonished said, and this is the Philippian jailer, of course, Lord, what do you want me to do? This is not Philippian jailer, this is Paul. I said that wrong. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Paul asked. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. This should be our attitudes as well. That is exactly right. Uh, Jensen, in the chat room, he shares the following thought. He says the reason Jesus started speaking in parables had to do with their unwillingness to hear. That's right, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. He came to seek those who are seeking him, Jensen goes on to say. Excellent points, excellent points and thoughts and comments. I really appreciate it. So let's go ahead and continue with our text. Again, if you'd like to participate, just uh, take a moment to read the ticker as it scrolls across the bottom. You can drop a comment in Facebook if you would like, or you can also drop a comment into YouTube as well. One more verse just popped up, so let me take a minute before we continue and bring it up on the screen there. And over in Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah chapter 18, Chuck shares this comment with us. Jeremiah writes the following. Let me get to the 16th verse there. No, 6th verse, that's right. I said it wrong. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are we in my hand, O house of Israel. Well, there you go, two two different uses of this concept, but it's very likely that when Paul referred to us being earthen vessels or clay pots, that those who were Jews might have even remembered and thought about this statement here by Jeremiah. And as Chuck goes on to say here in the chat room here with the application of what he just shared, we are the clay in the potter's hand, a new individual given a new heart by God. Jared says, according to Colossians 2, 11 through 12, we are given a new heart by God. And sure enough, when you look over there to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, you'll notice here the following. Paul writes, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Good point. All right, so let's jump back now to our text, back over into 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And notice with me, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there in... Let's come down to verse 7. Keep bringing the comments in if you would. We will catch up with those here in just a moment. But I do want to read a little bit farther here in the text. So the Apostle Paul, having made the point that we are earthen vessels, he then says there in verse 8, here's what we go through. And, and, And when you read this, you kind of think about ourselves as being earthen vessels, but yet we don't quite break as an earthen vessel would. Here's what I mean. We are hard pressed on every sign, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, Paul writes, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Now I'll pause there, it's not a great stopping point, but let me pause there for just a moment. Notice the way he he talks about how this weak earthen vessel is able to be perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And one may ask the question, why is that possible? What is it that makes it possible for this individual to be so strong despite everything that's going on. And it's simple. Look at verse 10. 
always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. When we daily remember that Christ died for us, then it helps us to be stronger. <clears throat> it helps us to keep on keeping on as the expression goes. Let's look at a couple of comments here before we continue with verse 11. <clears throat> So let's turn in our Bibles over to, be turning over to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. We'll bring that one up here in just a moment. 2 Chronicles, we're going to go to chapter 16. <coughs> yep. <clears throat> and before we read that, there's a comment or two that I need to bring in real quick, and then we'll consider that passage there. Mike says... The following, he says, we might ask just how much do each of us as Christians value the treasure? Oh, that opens up a whole nother discussion, Mike, and I appreciate that. We won't go there, but I appreciate that. And we might ask just how much do each of us as Christians value the treasure that God has given to us? It, it, you remember the man that was given the one talent? He went out and buried it and did not use it. Well, let me make sure that I'm not jumping in over what he said. Okay, I didn't. So I'll say this and we'll jump to the rest of Mike's comment here. So the man with one talent was given a treasure that he buried. He was lazy, did not want to use it. The other two men, the one with two talents, the one with five, went out and used the treasures that they had been given. Think about it that way. So what God has given to us, this treasure is not intended to be buried and hidden and kept away. It is intended to be used and multiplied and, and grown within our lives. But we have to consider it valuable. Mike goes on to say, pirates will always try to capture the treasure. As uh, gallant soldiers of Christ, we protect, we protect the treasure, though it be found in clay pots. And, and that is a very good point regarding what Paul said. You know, if you were going to, let's say you came into a lot of money, but you didn't trust banks, one of those people, and you decided to hide your money, you're going to find some place safe. You probably get you a big old safe that, that has to be, your house has to be built around the safe. It is so big and so heavy so that you can store your valuables and money in that safe. I guarantee you that safe is not a clay pot. And it would take a lot for someone to cut into that. I watched a video some months back. I don't remember where. Someone had bought an auction an auction of things that were being sold. And, and in the allotment was a safe. And it was one of the smaller safes, but they, they wanted to cut into it. And it took a whole lot of effort to, to cut into that safe. But I'm telling you, and this is Mike's point, our bodies are clay pots. And God gave us this great treasure to protect in these clay pots. That's a very, very good point there, Mike. All right, let's see. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Miss Nona shared this one with us a while ago. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. So, so think about it. And they're, and they're is obviously a context surrounding this. But notice this idea here, the statement, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Very, very good point. Um, looks like I skipped over a whole comment of Mike. Maybe this will make Mike's comment even more <laughs> meaningful. Tripoli Pirates, Tripoli Pirates Golf Challenge us to capture. <laughs> uh, I, ha I have Kelvin in, in a Zoom room and he's laughing at me. Um, <laughs> Tripoli Pirates Golf Challenges us to capture the treasure and destroy it. There we go. But when the soldiers of Christ, we are, we are to gallantly protect the treasures, though it be in the clay pot. All right, just still building on the idea of the clay part there. Jared, he makes the following comment, we always have a way of escape, and that's true. We talk about sin, 
There is always that way. He reminds us, Jared does, of 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses thir verse 13, how that no temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear, but will with that temptation make a way of escape. Okay. We can bear the temptation and we can be victorious over that temptation. We'll make the way for us to bear it. All right. Good comments. I appreciate that. But let's take a second and turn back now in our text. Let me get that back up on the screen here for you. So again, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we've talked about the earthen vessels hard-pressed on every side, enduring all the difficulties and the challenges here that we see within our text. Notice here what Paul goes on to say then. Always caring about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. So the death is working in us, but life in you. So an interesting thought here that he says, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Think about the Apostle Paul. Think about those who are giving their life for the cause of Christ here in the first century. Okay, They are, as it says, they are delivered to death for Jesus' sake. And based on when Paul wrote this, it is very likely that his journey to Rome is probably not far away. If I remember correctly, and I might be a little bit off on this, but I think this may have been written during Paul's third journey. Um, well, let me rephrase that. He visited them one last time on his third journey where he had to harbor there in that region for about three months. And so he continues his journey, and it's not long after that that he composes this letter to them and not long after that, he's on his way to Rome because he appealed to Caesar and ultimately would be judged. And then you know, we begin the, the rest of his life, not recorded by Acts, but ultimately apparently ends in him in his death. So he says, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. So then it is death working in us, but life in you. And so Paul and them were willing to pay the price to put their lives on the line so that the Corinthians and other Christians could live faithfully unto God. All right, let's see. Do we have any thoughts or comments? I would suggest that this is the same, should be the same thing spoken of us. We should be willing to always put our life on the line for the service of God, for serving him. Now, what qualifies is that, and I hate to say this, is what we see within the life of the apostles, and this is something that we don't face here, all right? For instance, what we're going through, our government is not saying, don't worship God, okay? We are forbidding you from worship God. If that was the case, I'd be in danger here in my house with what we're doing right now, studying his word. That's not what they're saying. All right, we are going through a temporary distress and we will get, we can worship God. We can study his word. We can teach it to others, but we will soon get back to the meeting places where we then in a public full fashion worship our heavenly father. But if the government was to say, okay, that's it. We are putting our foot down. No more religion, no men, no more worshiping God. You're not going to be allowed to follow Christianity, whatever. And it won't happen in my lifetime. I really don't think it will. It's at that moment that we must be willing to put our lives on the line, to be willing to step forward and serve God, just as the apostles did, just as the apostles did. All right, so let's go ahead now into this next section as Paul continues. We'll start in verse 13. He writes, and since we have, let me check our time real quick, folks. Okay, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore spoke. Oftentimes your Bibles will throw a handy dandy footnote up to you when there's a quote. You see that from Psalms 116 verse 10 is probably what your Bible shares as well. And I know this is going to be too small for you to read probably, but there the psalmist writes, I believe, therefore I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. And of course, there's going to be a context there to that. But Paul is quoting from that. And so, so we do the same thing. 
in amongst a time of distress, in amongst a time of persecution, we believe and therefore we speak is what Paul is saying. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Beautiful statement there, but it gives us Paul's motivation, his hope. And we've talked about hope before. Hope is an earnest expectation. It's not some wish or some dream. You know, a child may want a bicycle for Christmas, and so you may hope for a bicycle. But that's not the same thing as an expectation. And an expectation is going to be based upon the fact that you have enough reason to believe that someone's going to get this for you. It's like the parents saying, okay, next month, we get our next paycheck in, you're going to get your bicycle. So the next month rolls around, the child hopes and has proper hope for that bike because his parents have made the promise to him. And so here, why was it that the apostle Paul and others continued to believe and to speak and not give up? They believed that they would be raised up with Jesus and would be presented with other saints. There's the idea there behind verse four real quick. He says there, will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. The more people that Paul was able to teach, the more people that were converted to the truth, and on and on we go, the more people that praise God. All right, looks like we've got about three other comments in the chat room. Let me, uh, let's see, get those brought in to our discussion for the remainder <clears throat> of the time that we have. We have about three more verses in our text. We'll get to those here shortly. Jared sharing with us first Peter chapter three, verse 15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, Jared also points out Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he has rewarded those who diligently seek him. And Chuck chimes in as well on the discussion there about hope. Hope is the desire for an expectation to receive. I appreciate that, guys. That is exactly right. Feel free. we got just a couple minutes remaining. If you have any other final thoughts, go ahead and drop them in. But I will pick up real quick and read 16 through 18 of our text for tonight. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Think about it. We believe that we're going to be raised from the dead with all the faithful. We believe that. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And therein lies the point. This clay jar that we live in, that outward man is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. Think about Romans chapter 12 um, and other passages, the renewing of the mind. Our inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, Paul refers to his sufferings and everything as simply a light affliction, temporary. Only until this clay jar is finally broken. But this affliction is working for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The clay jar will finally shatter, but the treasure that God has given to us and our souls, we will spend eternity with God in heaven. Paul refers to that. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen, the things that are eternal, not temporary. And that should be our driving motivation. We need to look to that which is unseen and let it be the anchor of our soul that pulls us closer and closer to heaven with every day that we live. Dan Cross shares the following thought here. He says, the older we get, we get more physically weak, but as Christians, we get more spiritually strong. And that's right, according to verse 16, that's exactly right. You know, we age and the aging process doesn't stop until we die. 
But at the same time, our spiritual growth should never stop until the day we leave our body. And then we look forward to spending eternity with God in heaven. Let's turn over to Romans 14, verses 7 through 9 real quick. Jesse Kemp shares this with us for our consideration. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, and notice there with me in verse 7. The Apostle Paul here in writing to the church in Rome. Rome. <clears throat> Sorry. He writes the following. For none of us live to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. That is exactly right and a very good point to consider. And then Brother Chuck shares with us 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and note with me there in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's consider there... Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And to that we say, Amen. That is exactly right. That is the beauty we see within the Word of God. That's the beauty of the inspired Word. That is, beauty, that is the beauty of the hope that is promised to us, eternity, eternity with God in heaven. Well, according to my clock over here, we are at the top of the hour, and um, the preacher shouldn't be very long-winded frequently. And so we'll go ahead and pull our study to a close today. I'd like to thank you so much for all your comments, for all your participation your willingness to sit down through this matter, to, through this means, this avenue, this media, medium, I should say, and study the Word of God. You know, what, what I find really interesting about this, and while this can be viewed at a later point in time, this is real time for us right now. And I appreciate you sitting down with me, separated by houses and space and distance and so forth, but yet in this same moment of time, we've come together and to study the Word of God. I really, really appreciate that. Every, if everything goes according to plan, our next um, service, lack of a better word, our online Bible study may be a, way of, a better way of putting it. Um, we're still trying to work out all these words and proper term, terminologies and so forth, if you would. But it'll be Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. If you would, let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll be completed for the night. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy and for your loving kindness. We thank you for the earthen vessels that we live in, these bodies. We realize that they were never intended for us to live forever in, but to be a temporary dwelling place where we stay until we finally reach that promised land. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wisdom that is seen within the church we thank you for the wisdom that is seen within your word. <clears throat> and we thank you for sending Jesus to die upon the cross of Calvary so that we might have the remission of our sins. Heavenly Father, we ask that you please go with us and be with us and watch over us as we go through this week. And again, as many petitions have already been offered up, please continue to be with those and with those who are working on a treatment and a cure for the disease that we're facing so that we might be able to return to fully being able to assemble together side by side, hand in hand, offering up songs of praises to you. We ask now that you please be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all have a pleasant evening and a great week.